Thanks, IDP, for giving me the opportunity to speak to everyone about medicine, one of the most popular courses in Singapore, and in fact, all of Asia, I think. So today I'm going to be telling you a little bit about um, the process of applying to medicine in the UK, the pr process of admissions as a whole, and um, a little bit about the Bristol Medical School. I'm going to hopefully hit all the key questions I get asked at, at most of these events, and if you have any questions at the end of it, feel free to let me know in the Q&A. So we'll dive right into meeting the requirements. Um, so the first thing students go, students ask me is, am I qualified to do medicine? Which is a very important question because that's also the first thing universities look for. Um, medical schools typically look for a number of things. First and most important are grades. Um, so depending on the qualification that you take, it should be an A-level equivalent. And um, most universities will ask for a chemistry background. Some universities also make biology mandatory. So you need to make sure that you meet the A-level profile of the universities you're applying to. And don't worry too much if you've not taken a full suite of science units, because typically chemistry is the most important and or biology as well. Um, O-levels or GCSEs, um, IGCSEs, 10th standard, whatever, version of O-levels you've taken um, are usually looked at for as evidence of your numeracy and literacy abilities. So we'll want to see in most cases that you have A's in your O-level maths and English, um, except where you've done something like IB, where you'll take maths and English at a higher level anyway. So basically universities want to make sure that medical applicants have got a strong academic profile throughout their history of education. So that's the first thing we'll look at. Um, the UCAT, sorry, not UKCAT, UCAT or BMAT are additional tests that are required of all UK medical schools. They'll ask you for one or the other. Um, and these are basically online tests that are usually taken at test centers. But I think this year, the online testing has been, uh, has allowed students to take it from home as well. Testing your um, all sorts of different skills really. So you'll have, uh, for UCAT, which is what Bristol accepts, You've got a section that tests your um, reading and your reading abilities, so like your literacy. Um, and you've got a section that tests your mathematical abilities. You've got a section that tests you on situational judgment. So what you do in this situation or that situation. Um, so it's very comprehensive. And what I've been told by students is the hardest part of the UCAT test is that it is timed. So you need to answer tons of questions um, in a very short amount of time with a very short break in between before you go into the next set of questions. So I find that in terms of UCAT prep, most students like to do a few uh, test, test tests um, or sample tests, practice tests before they hit the real test because you can only take it once in an academic year. So you wanna make sure that you get a high score. It's uh, for UCAT, it's tested at a three, 600 and a good score for Bristol in a normal year is about two, 700 or so. Um, for this year, the scores have been through the roof and they're comparative, so you can also see how you've performed compared to everybody else who's taken the test. So this year, a large number of the students who have uh, gone on to the next level of the admissions process um, was scoring 3,000 and above. So yeah, it depends on how everyone else is doing. Work experience is strongly recommended for medicine, mostly because so many people have it. And uh, the interesting thing about work experience is it's not what you might think. So a lot of students get um, work experience shadowing doctors. And then this year, there's a lot of panic about, well, I can't shadow a doctor this year because I'm not allowed. But actually, universities are looking for any kind of work experience that shows that you've got the skills that are needed uh, that are relevant to being a doctor. Um, so for Bristol, um, our admissions um, tutor for medicines actually said that they really like having um, applicants who've had work experience at McDonald's because you learn how to deal with difficult uh, customers or clients, you learn about time management, how to like, um, you, you work in shifts a lot of the time at McDonald's at ECU, you work in shifts as a, at a hospital as well. Um, so there's just, a, there's a lot, there are a lot of parallels between different types of jobs and medicine. And what you wanna do is make sure that you've had some amount of work experience that you can relate to medicine in, in one way or another, that you can relate to the skills that are relevant to medicine. So even if it's not in a healthcare setting, it still could count. Your personal statement is important as well because the personal statement is a differentiating factor to your application where all the other students will have A's in all their subjects and a high UCAT score and things like that. Your personal statement tells us about your hobbies, um, your interests, who you are as a person outside of academia. And that can be really useful because that is a place to tell us about your soft skills. So um, you're fluent in six languages or you play the violin or um, 
you know, anything unique or special about you. Take note as well that universities across the UK have got different age limits. So at Bristol, for example, we firmly need students to have turned 18 by the 1st of October, the year that they want to come in. Some universities will allow students to come in when they're 17, some might, might have this 18 and above limit. And the reason for that is usually um, you need to be 18 and above to get an NHS pass. Um, and a university like Bristol that has early patient contact will ask you to be 18 so you can get that NHS pass right from your first year. So make sure you meet the requirements. Um, you'll also be thinking, well, where am I going to apply? So some students might go for this first to make sure you meet the requirements, but um, yeah, don't worry, this is not like a, like a hard and fast rule. So the things to consider when you're looking at universities to apply to, first of all, Singapore recognizes hardly any UK universities, only 16 of them are uh, on the list that's done by the Singapore Medical Council. So make sure that the universities you're applying for are there because you might want to work at home. So make sure it's um, open to you. The number of spaces. There are quotas for international students to study medicine in the UK. Every university has got a limit. At Bristol, it's 20 places. In other universities, it might be up to like 40 something. In some universities, it might be like 10. So you want to make sure um, that you know where you're applying to and you know what your odds are of getting in. Which location? Um, as you know, the UK has um, four countries, actually. I'm not actually sure if Northern Ireland, I think Northern Ireland probably does have medical programs as well, but the other countries, England, Wales, and Scotland, vary in terms of culture and cost of uh, living and their degree structures as well might, change, might, might differ. Their medical systems, they're all, it's all covered by the NHS, but there may be slight differences. So make sure you know where your university is based and make sure you know if you like the place that it's gonna be based. Some universities have got city campuses like Bristol and some have got closed campuses. So the location actually is really important because you'll be spending a lot of time in, the, in that city. Um, the course name is actually not that important of a thing to consider. Um, you'll find lots of different abbreviations, uh, but they all mean the same thing, Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery. So don't be too bothered if, if it varies from one university to another. Yeah, that's common. The cost structure. So the UK has got a lot of complicated like differences between universities. The main thing to know is the standard medical degree takes five years. Some universities make it mandatory for you to do something called intercalation, which is where you take um, a sort of year off from medicine in between your degree to do something else that's uh, specialized in a particular area. So for example, biomedical science, or you can even do something like history if you're interested in the history of medicine, um, virology, any kind of clinical science. So the benefit of intercalation is you will get a bachelor's degree in that field that you intercalate in to add to your collection of degrees when you graduate from medicine. So you only do one year of a biomedical science degree or related field, but you'll get a degree at that point, and then you return to your medical degree. Some universities make it optional. That's like Bristol makes it, it's, it's optional. It's available to students in Bristol. Some universities make it mandatory, which would make your degree then six years long. Um, you also want to look at things like um, how many years of preclinical training do you have um, or just clinical. So preclinical is where you learn about health systems. You just look at like charts of anatomy or something like that. And you go like, okay, I've got to memorize all these thousands of bones. Um, and then clinical is where you actually go into the hospital and you start um, messing about with those bones. So um, some universities offer two years of preclinical, some universities offer three years of preclinical. So you'll need to um, familiarize yourself with the different curricula that's set by each university. Teaching methods. Um, so this is a continuation of the previous slide. Um, you, if you've done much research, you'll know that there are some universities that use traditional teaching and learning. And I think Oxford and Cambridge are one of the most prominent, uh, two of the most prominent examples of this type of teaching. Traditional learning means you go to a lecture hall, you receive information via lecture, and then you go to a seminar and you discuss the information you receive through the lecture. Problem-based learning is a little bit more interactive and a little bit more, um, I guess, modern. Um, and it's offered by loads of other universities, um, loads of universities. So that would be 100% problem-based learning where you learn about medicine through looking at real life cases and then trying to figure out how to solve them. Um, and it's similar to case-based learning as well. So problem-based learning gives you a problem that may or may not be real. Case-based learning looks at mostly real life cases. 
Integrated um, teaching methods are the most common now in the UK. So most universities use a combination of traditional lectures and seminars, as well as problem or case-based learning to help you sort of learn in different ways. Um, the reality of medicine is that you have to think on your feet a lot in the actual, when you're actually in practice. And so problem and case-based learning help you do that. They help you gather facts about a patient and then present a diagnosis. And the, the good thing is that you'll be with a group of people so different people will have different opinions and you'll get to sort of figure out how, where, like how to think in a, a more broad way, basically. Last thing to consider um, is the fee structure. So um, universities can have fees in one of two ways. One way is that they charge you the same fee every year. Um, and that fee is say about 30,000 pounds every year. Other way of charging you fees is to charge you a different fee for preclinical years and it's another fee for clinical years. So you might pay like £25,000 for the first two years and then £35,000 for the last three years. So um, yeah, expect a difference because each university has got their own way of doing it. Also bear in mind that Scottish universities now have to, um, they've imposed a levy on medical students, on international medical students of £10,000 and that covers the clinical aspects so that goes to the NHS. So if you notice, um, Scottish universities may have slightly more, more expensive, actually 10,000 pounds more expensive um, medical fees. That's going to be normal for Scottish universities. UK, uh, English universities have not yet been impacted. Okay, so um, let me just check the time to make sure I'm not going on too long. Um, okay, so UCAS is the UK central admission service. So all applications to medicine go through UCAS. Um, I don't think it's possible to apply um, to any other through like directly to the university, but for the most, I mean, UCAS is the safest way to apply. Um, you will take um, your UCATs and BMATs and or um, from July onwards, depending on when it's available in your country. Um, and UCAS opens for applications from September, the first week of September. It closes for medicine applications 15th of October. Um, on UCAS, you are, most students are allowed to have five choices. Medicine, medicine students are allowed to have four medicine choices and one non-medicine choice. So most students go for something associated to health sciences, like, well, it depends. Um, so biomedical science is a popular one. Some students go for psychology or um, biochemistry, other types of life sciences. Um, and if you are going for national service, it is pretty common for Bristol anyway, to have NS men who apply at the point, um, they apply over several years. They apply in the first year of NS and the second year of NS. Um, Bristol does allow deferrals, but if you want to defer for two years, then it's based on a case, it's a case by case um, kind of situation. So we'll see if we can give you a place two years down the road, but most of the time we, we ask students to apply no more than two years before they want to come so that you can only defer for one year. Basically, deferral is an option. Um, you can choose to have it go through your whole application process one year before you actually plan to enter university. For example, a student who's applied in September 2020 can choose to come to university in September 2021. If he wants to come to university in September 2022, then it's case by case. But for 2021, it's fine. Yeah, and you'll need to check on this with each university to see what they do allow. There's no real um, problem with applying several years in a go. Um, so if you don't get in the first year you apply, feel free to apply again. The, some things will have to change so that your UCAT score changing could make a big difference. Um, so resources, like I guess this is how to find out more information about, um, about different university courses. Go through their websites. Their websites are super comprehensive. They're very up to date. Each university has got so many different little details that will matter to you as an applicant. So go through the university's website as well as their admission statement, which is usually a document um, produced by the admissions office with the school in question that goes that tells you like all about um, what they're looking for in admissions, what the interview process is like, what they're looking for in a personal statement. It's very comprehensive. So have a look um, around for this document. It might be called different things in different universities. I cannot recommend the Singapore Medical Society of the UK enough, mostly because it consists of students who successfully gotten into the course. So really good network of students who have made it through and can tell you about their experience making it through. 
Um, and they also have virtual and in-person events in Singapore during the summertime. So if you follow them on Facebook or you register for their updates and things, um, you'll see when they're next doing something. And you can also um, be put in touch with different people who are studying at SMC approved universities. So yeah, you can chat with someone from Bristol directly or at the universities. Websites like the Medic Portal, which is focused on medicine, or the Student Room, which is a forum for students, can, can expose you again to different perspectives of what it's like to apply for medicine in different universities. So this can be quite helpful, but be sure to take everything with a pinch of salt because the best resource is still gonna be the university's website. I like blogs. Um, I find it very helpful to watch a student talk about their experience. And so um, you can find really good blogs about um, applying, interviewing, being on the course on YouTube. Um, so there are loads of them for loads of different universities. If you want to look for some um, that are related to Bristol, there's a student called Manisha who, who um, applied for two years in a row to get into medicine and finally got in in the end to Bristol. And so she has got a really interesting blog which talks you through the entire two year process. And then now that she's at Bristol, her current student experience. Um, another girl is called Luna Scope, who's a student from Hong Kong who, um, who is in her fifth year of medicine. So really, really interesting. She cries all the time. That's medicine. <laughs> so um, not all the time, she cries sometimes. So yeah, like um, very interesting look into um, the actual experience of a medical student, really recommend it. And I've also compi compiled a playlist of different videos that relate to um, student experience, student experiences in Bristol, which you can check out later. I'll put the link um, in the chat. Talk to your teachers, family and friends. They know you as well as you know you probably, and they can also kind of help you figure out um, what places, what sort of environment would work best for you and how you learn best and things like that. Talk to IDP Singapore, who will be able to help you with the application part of the process, as well as visa application and things like that later on. So, um, so now you kind of have a sense of how to apply and where to apply, but what happens at the point of application? So, once you submit your application on UCAS, it goes through to all the different universities. And, um, and the next step in the process is that they will um, sort of score you based on everything you've submitted. So you get a score for your UCAT, you get a score for your uh, personal statement, for your grades. Um, you get a score for everything you've submitted, basically. And the higher your score is overall, depending on the weighting that universities place on different elements of the application. At Bristol, we give a very high weighting to UCAT. So typically, the students who are invited to interview first are the ones who've got the sky high UCAT score. Yeah, but again, universities will vary throughout the UK. So once they score you, they will categorize you into interview, hold, or reject. So if you're an interview or reject, typically you hear from the university first. Rejections are given out quickly to students who are definitely not going to make it, who are not in the top 50% or so of performing students because um, just, just the way it works because of, of the volume of applications we get. Um, so that will usually happen in the first couple of months after you apply. And the same for interviews. So depending on whether the interviews, how the interviews are delivered, we start to issue interview in invitations as early as October. And uh, when interviews are held in person, in normal long COVID years, um, they take place from November onwards. So these two statuses, interview and reject, you'll find out about them fairly soon. Hold is the one that's the most painful because you basically won't hear from us until you fall into interview or reject categories. Um, so you've just got to wait patiently and you can be in there for quite a long time. So really gotta be patient. Um, so I was saying interviews are carried out from October to March um, and yeah, you may or may, you may move between categories within this period. You, it's very, you can't go from reject to hold or interview though. So once you're rejected, that's a final decision. And you must go to the interview to be given an offer to the university. So if you um, haven't been given an interview, there is absolutely no chance of you getting an offer. If you have been for an interview, but um, you are put on hold, that means that you may be given an offer as late pretty late in the cycle, only if someone else drops out and, and their spot's given to you. In terms of interviews, um, so in a normal year, most universities or a lot of the top universities will have interviews in the UK. Some also have them in Singapore, but it's 
it usually means that you, it's a physical interview. You need to go to a place and someone will ask you questions and, or they might test you on different things. Um, it's in person, face to face. For 2021 though, most universities have had to hold online only interviews. Um, and so for students applying for next year's entry, it remains to be seen whether or not you'll get in person or online interviews. But um, the, the actual content of the interviews shouldn't change too much. And no matter what, um, home and international students will try will have the same interview experience um, as much as possible. So if um, home students are given in person interviews, then international students will be expected to will find a way of giving them in person interviews in a country in their region. Yeah. Um, so your interview may consist of MMIs, multiple mini interviews, where you go from station to station and you spend like five or six minutes at each station being tested on different skills and abilities. So um, a common um, MMI um, station is where they ask you to make a decision about you've, you've got a you've got to do a liver transplant and the people um, who are eligible for the liver transplant are um, an old person, a drug addict, um, and then some other like other situations. And you have to make an ethical decision about who to give it to and why. So it's one of those types of tests that has no right or wrong answer. The examiners, the, the interviewers just want to see your train of thought to understand how you think and how you work. You might be given um, challenges that are more about dexterity you might be tested on your knowledge of biology or of human conditions. So it can vary again, and it's all kept extremely confidential. So you won't really find much specific information about university interview questions online because it's not allowed. Um, so just try and I guess watch as many of those experience blogs and blogs um, as, as you can so that you can like learn about how these students prepared and then just try and emulate that. Um, and also just going with an open mind, just be genuine so that you, you know, like feel confident enough to, if someone asks you a question, you think about it and you give them your answer. That's the best way to go through an interview. So other universities may have a panel interview where you sit down and they sit down and they just ask you questions about the most common one, why do you want to do medicine? Um, and then they might refer to your personal statement as well. So you say that you've worked in this hospital or in this call center um, for six months, what was the most um, important thing you learned or what was the most important thing you achieved, like stuff like that. So a panel interview is fairly straightforward because it just feels like an interview, a standard interview. So now I hope that's given you some insight into the admissions part um, or the pre-offer bits of applying to medicine. Now the aftermath. So only two things are possible when you apply for medicine. First, the happiest possibility. Congratulations, you've received an offer and you'll hear that, you'll see that on your UCAS email and you'll see messages on your UCAS um, portal as well. Um, offers are issued pretty slowly for medicine because it takes a while to get through all of the interviews. So you might be interviewed in November and have to wait until May to find out if you got an offer or not. Um, so don't stress out about it, just wait um, and um, you can contact the university to find out if um, they can give you an earlier decision, but if they're not ready to make that decision yet, then it might be a negative decision. So just have a think about it. Um, some offers can be issued pretty early though. If you do really well in your interview, sometimes you can receive an offer within a month from that. So um, it varies. Um, if you have applied with all achieved results, you can get an unconditional offer. If you're applying with predicted results, you'll be given a conditional offer. So the really important thing at that point is to make sure you meet the conditions that are stated on your offer, because there'll be a whole lot of reserve students um, who will be after your seat if you don't meet the conditions of your offer. So that's best case scenario. Um, slightly less better case scenario is unfortunately, we were not able to make you an offer. And of course, you know, Bristol's only got 20 seats. Most universities receive like dozens of applications per space, if not hundreds. So um, don't worry too much. It definitely does happen that some students spend a few years applying for medicine and it's up to you to decide whether or not you want to do that. Other things you can do are look at alternative courses. So some students will go on to do um, a life science or something to do with human health to prepare them for graduate entry medicine. And especially if you know, like you are not 
really confident enough at this point to go straight into medicine, which is quite a tiring like and stressful course. Um, that can be a great way to kind of ease yourself into university life before going on to apply for medicine afterwards. Um, so that's an option. You can take a gap year. Universities in the UK love gap years as long as you do something with them. Um, and if you know the thing that kind of held you back was your UCAT score, then you know that you can take some time to work on your UCAT um, testing abilities. If the thing that held you back was your interview, then you can go and get more life experiences that you feel a bit more confident going into an interview. You can do so much with a gap year. And one thing I strongly recommend to students applying to medicine, apply everywhere. I mean, make sure it's recognized by the SMC, I guess, but make sure you like, try and apply everywhere because there are limited spaces for medicine in most places in the world. It's a very coveted and popular kind of course. So if you're very serious about becoming a doctor, you'll need to um, explore all avenues and that involves applying to all the countries for all the medicine courses. Um, so yes, it's not the end of the road if you don't get an offer. So um, hopefully that gives you a sense of um, what it's like to, what the admissions process is like for um, medicine in the UK. Some fast facts about medicine at Bristol. Um, so we only have 20 places per year for international students, but the good news for Singaporeans is for some reason, for Singapore based students anyway, for some reason you all perform really well in UCAT and then again, really well in the interview. So um, like every year that I've worked at Bristol, we've had at least five Singaporeans, uh, five Singapore based students get into the medicine course, um, which gives you a success like ratio, success percentage um, of 10% which is scary, but still much more doable than like zero point something percent. So yeah, definitely consider it. Um, in Bristol, the first two years are preclinical and the last three years are clinical. Um, so you will um, be given placements at hospitals throughout the Southwest. So you get quite a lot of really good um, urban and um, suburban and rural experience within your placements. What Bristol students love about Bristol is that they get early patient contact. So they'll be in hospitals right from year one um, you'll do 24 hour shifts, I think twice in your first year. And it's, so, you know, you'll be learning a lot of uh, things that you've got to memorize about bones and nerves and like stuff like that. And it'll be really, they really like the ability to see that in practice and to see, to learn a bit about like patient care, the non-clinical skills um, that are, that a doctor has to have. Um, yeah, so the early patient contact is definitely, definitely one of the highlights of our medical degree. It's also really holistic. So if you're the sort of person who um, is creative, Bristol's a great place to study medicine because um, in order to sort of expand your thinking and your like work on your emotional skills, the um, the elements of art and music that are embedded in the course. So I think one of the things you have to do in your first year is um, write a medical song, perform to the tune of some popular song um, about, how you feel about medicine. There's a lot of, I guess, um, yeah, emotional management that is embedded into the course to help you sort of learn how to cope with the experience of uh, doing a medical degree and then being a doctor. Um, the support for applying to NHS placement. So um, whether or not you get placed in the NHS depends on your the number of points you've achieved at the end of your degree, which then again are based on how you perform in the last few years of your degree. So. Um, the university provides support for students who are looking for placements and sort of guidance on where you can apply to placements um, in the UK for if that's what you're after. And also it's a very social school so um, there's lots of um, events that are to do with uh, so socials like balls and proms and things and then also like baking and sports and dances and things are like classes that you can take with the med medicine student community. Um, and again it's just to make sure that you are kind of doing okay and not too entrenched in the stress of medicine. Um, so I think that's it for me. Um, all the best to all of you. Hope you're still listening and um, all the best for your applications to medicine and then, you know, like all the stuff that comes after that. It is challenging, but um, if you really are into the field, hopefully it'll all be worth it at the end of the day. <laughs> um, please, if you have any questions, feel free to email me or my colleagues at the Southeast Asia office bristol.ac.uk. You can also direct message us on Instagram if you follow us um, at bristol.ca. Thank you. Thank you, Sumitra.
that was really hilarious. <laughs> I don't know if you guys um, were in, you know, picked up on all uh, your um, the nuances, but it was hilarious. Thank you so much, Sumita. I was laughing so hard. Um, thank you so much, Christelle, of course, for the in-depth insight uh, and all the advice for our students um, into the admissions process, particularly for medicine and what to expect. And even with the post um, uh, UCAS application stage of it, uh, yes, there's a lot of waiting. Yes, it's super competitive. Um, and yes, do apply everywhere. So today we have all our university representatives um, uh, today, all, are, all come from um, UK, Canada and Ireland over in our main uh, virtual fair. And even with the seminars, we all feature like representatives from these three countries uh, today. Um, and tomorrow we'll have Australia, New Zealand. But if you've got any questions about Australia, New Zealand medical schools, all you have to do is hop onto the link in our main chat and speak to our counselors in the counseling room and they'll guide you through that. Um, IDP actually holds a lot of course uh, specific events as well. We actually just had a study medicine and dentistry event last Saturday, um, complete with test preparation um, information and an insight uh, with our current students and recent medical graduates um, from the Singapore Medical Society of Australia and New Zealand. So it's great knowing that we've got a similar society uh, for the UK and uh, you know, keep in contact with us, follow us on, on our socials, uh, keep in contact with your counsellors uh, to stay tuned for uh, such an initiative if we do one, uh, do one for the UK. Right, so we're running a little bit uh